Good afternoon, everybody.
One of our great American presidents, Woodrow Wilson, when he was president of Princeton University, reminded his students on occasions such as this, you're not here merely to make a living. You are here in order to enable the world to live more amply, with greater vision, with a finer spirit of hope and achievement. You're here to enrich the world, and you impoverish yourself if you forget the errand. Today's a great day to give thanks to everybody who made this solemn occasion possible, to the parents and families, faculty and staff, administrators and trustees, but most significant of all, to our graduates. These men and women exemplify the tradition of Claremont McKenna College, and they are prepared to make their mark in the world. O Creator, whom we know by many names and titles, on this sacred afternoon we come together to give thanks and honor to these graduates. By great achievements and profound losses, these men and women have come to realize their gifts and training to transform the world. We are confident that they will enrich the world as President Wilson charged the graduates of his day. We remember with great admiration Ali Wallace Mirza, a beloved member of this class. Ali was known as a generous, sensitive young man who cherished his family and friends and who placed the happiness and interest of others ahead of his own. We ask that you watch over his family and friends and let, let us never forget what a great gift Ali has been to all who had the privilege of knowing him. O oh God, we offer you these words of hope and prayer. May our graduates never forget the lessons learned here, nor underestimate their potential for enriching the world. May they always find the courage to stand for the benefit of humanity. May they use their gifts of intelligence to create a more compassionate world. May they inspire others to live more amply by their great vision. May they experience the peace that comes from leaving the world better than you inherited it. Amen. Thank you, Father Fenton. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing and join the graduates in our alma mater. Maestro. <laughs> Please be seated. Thank you, Father, for your inspiring invocation, and thank you, Elizabeth, for that beautiful voice. <laughs> Higher education could transcend many challenges if every registrar could sing like that. <laughs> well, it's a glorious, wonderfully cool afternoon, and it's great to be with you. I'm Hiram Chodash. I'm president of Claremont McKenna College, actually just a sophomore here at CMC. And I am, thank you, I am humbled and I am moved by the honor to welcome you to the graduation ceremony for my senior classmates, the class of 2015. Class of 2015, today we turn a page of our CMC story with your graduation. We embrace and laugh, we stand and clap, 
pose and smile, snap and click. But before we get too lost in the noise of it all, let's promise to slow the shutter, widen the aperture, focus the wide angles, reflect on our subjects, to see, to hear, to touch, to taste, to feel how momentous this is. Momentous. First to think of and thank those who are not here with us. Those on whose shoulders we stand, in whose shoulders we sought comfort, from whom we learned, with whom we danced and laughed and grew, and we remember those we tragically lost and dearly miss. Tamar Kaplan from the class of 2014 and Ali Mirza from the class of 2015. Today, we remember Ali, his spirited and giving nature, his courage and zest for life. He completes his CMC journey here with us today. We cannot bring him back. We can never do enough to honor his memory, but we can take Ali with us across the stage today. And as with Tamar Kaplan and the class of 2014 last year, this year in Ali's memory, our graduates will create space in their hearts and in their procession. And for both, we have created a special posthumous letter of arts and collegiate studies. Ali's was presented to the Mirza's earlier today in order to mark the completion of his CMC journey. Ali's letter represents the 10th academic accomplishment of his amazing Claremont family with Mustafa, his dad, class of 76, Liz, his mom, graduate of CGU in 79, and Akbar, his older brother, graduate of the class of 2013. Would you please stand to be recognized and let's give them all a, a strong round of applause. We all know the Mirzas are just one of our amazing CMC families we recognize here today. We celebrate the support of our graduates by so many. The selfless commitment, investment, and support of your grandparents, who sacrificed so much to build a better world for you. Your parents who sheltered, fed, clothed you, who read to you and counted with you, who chauffeured you, even nagged and moved you and all of your immediate and extended families and friends who had confidence in you and shaped who you are today. Let's give them a round of applause. And we thank our inspired faculty and staff at CMC whose commitment to you and your success is without parallel and who have nurtured you your minds in the classrooms and labs, your ability to compete on our fields, courts, pools, tracks, and courses, to freshen your thoughts and palates at the ath, in Collins and at the hub. And we thank our generous board of trustees, our donors, our dedicated alumni, who have worked tirelessly, brilliantly, brilliantly fiercely behind the scenes to provide the extraordinary resources and guidance for your benefit and success. Graduates, let's give everyone who supported you a strong so showing of your appreciation. But most of all, we congratulate you, the class of 2015. You've taught me the last two years what it means to be a member of this community. Through your fun-loving spirit, your great conversations, your engaging minds, from the chutzpah to th throw me in a shallow pool of water, <laughs> to your award-winning research and publications, high-impact enterprises, and innumerable competitive achievements. And we celebrate you for your many invaluable contributions to the college, the courage to step up to the challenges of personal and social responsibility, reminding everyone that it's on us and that standing by must give way to stepping up and stepping in. We celebrate your teamwork to create our Ashoka U Changemaker Campus, the creativity to grow opportunities for artistic expression, 
And in the midst of an incredibly busy year, the selfless, inspiring, breathless, and exceptionally hot student marathon run for socioeconomic diversity and the student imperative through CMC 26.2. Let's give our graduates a round of applause for all they have taught us and for an outstanding four years. As two exemplars of CMC 2015, your classmates Nick Weiss and Kayla Nahn will now present the Latin salutation. Congregationem amatissimam. O vos omnes qui transitis in octie fugete, minigne excipimus matres, patres, consanguinios, magistros, curatores, quandam amantes, <laughs> condoscipuasque, gratis in primis agimus, matribus amatissimis et patribus honorotissimis. Salutamus virum dactissimum, rectitudinis roborei, presidentem iramum chodashum, <laughs> maxilla firma facit virum. <laughs> Et ilum propitium magistrum magistrorum dicanum Nicolaum Warnerum. <laughs> Et ilum bis famosum decanum Jeffersonum Huangum. Et tabularium delectam, Elizabetham Morganam, cuius electronici nuncti non diu pereteret nos peccatores. Excipimus praesertim Davidum megrublianum, cohortemque illustrissimum supernalum curatorum suum, munificentiorum maicenati. Largiantur usque ad ultimum judicium. Gratisis agimus professoribus sapientibus. Ducibus verendis in weat portuosa uh, discendi. Magnum iter ascendimus sendant nobis vires. Nec, praecipue obliviscamur oratorum illustrissimam Adram Nafticiam, Fortissimam Fortium, Laeinam Auream Imaginationis. Sine imaginatione, Nulla somnia. Sine somnibis, Nulla ars. Sine arte, Nihil. Euge, <laughs> vivat et eloquatur semper, et postremo amici, per nebulam lacrimarum, te crapulationibus paine oblitis. Laudemus nomen semper virens ilius, coetus caelestis, semideorum, semidiarumque, gervorum et athenarum, flagellorum galine infandae, fratrum sororumque in aeternum. Classis, gloriosissimi, dua, milia, quique! Ic est enem ipse dies discressus nostri, dies expectatus quator annis. Eu, fugaces, fratres, sororosque, labuntor anni. Nec pietas moram rugis, et instanti senectae afferet. Domios domiotaque morti. Orae cedunt, et dies, et menses, et anni. Nec praeteritum, <laughs> tempus umque vereretitur. Multa ferunt ani venientes commoda secum, multa recedentes adimunt. 
quando cogito de amicis ic congregatis et de usibus communalibus, in lacrimortalis imbrem qui numquam venit, de relinquandis liceta, mahometo, nademo, qui cum nobis odie sunt. Et temari et alio, in absentia qui in cordibus nostris in aeternum manibunt, de iteribus in deserto. De Filipso, de Bergero, pater meis, de Wirerdi, mihera domibus heroum heroidarum, et rerum corribanti corum. De cornibus aureis, de studiis et ic et proquo, de oikonomicis quinquaginta, de consectatione negotii, mehercule, de tesibus edipo, et semper, semper, de amicitia immortali in aeternum. Si voltus amari? Amate. Si voltus memoriae teneri? Tenete memoria. Si voltus consolari? Revertite quito et saipe, et tenete semper in memoria aic verba personantia et gravida sapientiae. Crescit cum commercio civitas! Gracias, Fobisi. Graduates, thank you. Graduates, today as you cross this special threshold, your undergraduate years come to a sad yet exciting end, and you'll join the ranks of our college's alumni community. We have one of the most engaged, devoted groups of alumni in higher education today. Their impact on the college and their love for it is evident in every aspect of life on our campus. The history of CMC is a great American story, a story of the greatest generation who overcame the worst in humanity to generate the best in humanity. A great generation who built a dynamic college from the rubble in this valley. That grand project continues today with you. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you John McDowell, a member of the class of 1979 and president of our Alumni Association, who will provide our alumni greeting and tell you more about your new relationship to the college in the years ahead. John. Chairman Magrublian, President Chadash, Dr. Nafisi, trustees, distinguished faculty, staff, parents, and especially graduates, let me be the first to welcome you, the class of 2015, to the Claremont McKenna College Alumni Association. You're now part of a family that stretches back to our college's founding. For some colleges and universities, that family stretches back for generations, but not for us. We're young, and as President Chodash likes to say, we're scrappy. Our swift rise to prominence means that every member of our family counts, and now you are part of that family. The alumni family connects you with our very first students. And since we are so young, some of our original students are alive today. In fact, you might have met some of them during alumni weekend just two weeks ago. But now it's time for you to become a full member of the CMC family. It's time for you to continue the tradition of excellence started by our earliest students and alumni. What does that mean exactly? It means building on the same experience that you had here as a student. Just because you are graduating does not mean that your CMC experience is at an end. In some ways, it is just beginning. It means relying on those around you, your fellow alumni, really your aunts and uncles and cousins and brothers and sisters, to be as supportive of you as you were of each other. So are you looking for a career connection? Then look no further than our new EverTrue alumni app. That's where you'll find people across the country and around the world willing to help you. Looking for a place to live in a new city? Look no further than your local alumni. 
They can tell you about the neighborhoods, they can tell you about the nightlife, and they maybe will be even offer a place to sleep while you get on your feet. But do you, do you need a lawyer, an accountant? <laughs> Somebody needs a lawyer, okay, an accountant, <laughs> a doctor, or even an investor? Well, then look for CMC alumni in your area. Each time that you reach out to your fellow CMCers, you're building family connections. And like any family, you're connected to future generations, those students and alumni who will come after you. Your job will be to keep our family relations strong and to help those students and alumni behind you on their path as they build on the success that you will enjoy. Part of staying connected with the CMC family is to help it grow our future success. Getting involved in the Forum for the Future and paying attention to your support of the Alumni Fund are two important ways to show your ongoing concern and love for our college. In closing, let me give you a couple of practical tips for connecting with your fellow alumni. So first, when you move, use the Evertrue app, update your address in the alumni database. You know, across the world, we have 19 alumni chapters that hold great events. However, if you live in Silicon Valley, but the that database thinks you live with, with your parents in Wisconsin, you won't be alerted to those networking activities. Second, keep up with us on social media. Facebook page, Twitter feed, LinkedIn group, it's all there for you, our alumni. And third, return for alumni weekend to reconnect with the college and your friends. It just happened two weeks ago. You saw how much fun we had. You had some fun too, I think. And, uh, and you'll, you'll enjoy coming back for alumni weekend as well. So we're, we're excited that you are now part of the Alumni Association family. Congratulations on a job well done and on a bright and beckoning future. Class of 2015, we can't wait to see what you'll do next. Thank you. Thank you, John. I just love when someone from the class of 79 gives our students advice on social media. <laughs> Well, it's now time for this year's class elected speaker, Clancy Tripp. Clancy, Clancy is originally from South Bend, Indiana. During her time at CMC, she majored in literature and film studies with a sequence in gender studies, in which she completed an award-winning thesis. She's the editor-in-chief of the 5C satirical publication, The Golden Antlers, she worked as a head consultant for the Center for Writing and Public Discourse. She was also active in CMC's theater troupe, Under the Lights. This upcoming year, Clancy will be moving to New York City, where she'll be working to earn her master's in education at Columbia's Teachers College, with plans to teach high school English in an urban setting. Clancy, it's all yours. Thank you, President Chodosh. Thank you to all of our distinguished guests. Thank you to the professors who braved the rain to be here for us today in your less than breathable costumes. Thanks to the administrators and staff who got us to this point. Thank you to my fantastic Midwest family, mom, dad, Ro, and Mo, for giving me access to this education, the greatest gift I could ask for. And thank you to my West Coast family who made the trek out here to support me today. And of course, thanks so much to my fellow members of the class of 2015 for taking a gamble and letting the class clown make the graduation speech. <laughs> I'll try to do the occasion justice. Four years ago, I made the insane decision to apply to 19 different colleges. In preparation for the speech, I reread some of the essays, and it turns out I was applying to so many colleges that I got a little bit confused. The first line of my application to Pomona College reads, I kid you not, there are many reasons why I believe Claremont McKenna College is the right place for me. I was rejected, <laughs> obviously. 
but even had I not made such an egregious error, I have to believe that I would have ended up here anyways. The age-old saying holds true. We end up where we belong. Once I got to campus, in the fall of 2011 with all of you, I tried my hardest to be the typical CMCer. I desperately wanted to learn how to surf, even though I am incapable of floating, let alone swimming. I studied for Coachella more than I studied for my FHS final. I wanted to run for every ASCMC position that existed. I wanted the best internships, and I, and I wanted to wear bro tanks that would allow me to show off my sweet biceps. <laughs> My sophomore year, I flirted with the idea of applying to work at the Student Investment Fund, which, <laughs> for those of you who don't know me, is a little out of my skill set. I never took Econ 50, and the highest math course I took was Intro to Statistics, twice. <laughs> this desire to be the stereotypical CMCer still hits me even now. Sometimes I'll wake in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, only to find out I've sleep Googled Deloitte starting salaries. <laughs> in 2012, when we were sophomores, the Office of Student Philanthropy launched a campaign called I Am CMC. They plied us with food trucks and free shirts. They rounded up dozens of students to write essays on why they were CMC or to share their particular I am CMC story in a snazzy video montage. Several years later, the movement is still going pretty strong. Many of us still wear, still wear our shirts proudly, even if by now we have cut off the sleeves or fashioned them into more weather-appropriate belly shirts. The phrase I am CMC still lingers in on-campus political races, forum articles, and conversations with our parents when we ask them to pay our dorm damages fees. <laughs> But I'm here to tell you that I am not CMC, and neither are you. One of my favorite quotes comes from Kurt Vonnegut, my literary idol and the ultimate sassiness extraordinaire. He once wrote, we are what we pretend to be, so we must be careful about what we pretend to be. At some point, for all of us, we have let CMC define us. We all know the stereotype. CMCs work hard and play harder. We are competitive and type A, and our average SAT score is 3,000. <laughs> we are sporty and social and hoping for a re rewarding career in iBanking. We are a bunch of brilliant bros. I guarantee that there are parts of this stereotype that apply to every single one of us. Otherwise, we wouldn't have found each other and built this beautiful community. I'm guilty of it, too. When people ask me my major, I say, literature, film, and gender studies, the three most lucrative career options of all time. <laughs> but the truth is, I'm not in it for the money. If I was, I would have tried a little harder to complete my application for the Robert Day School. CMC and the stereotypes surrounding it, in some way, define us all. But they're not the whole story. We are not CMC. CMC is us. We define CMC, not the other way around. When visitors come to our campus to see what CMC is like, they see us, wandering the campus, filling up the classroom, starting new initiatives, pouring champagne on Green Beach, loving and supporting each other the best way we know how. Look around you today and see what you have built during the past four years. Compare the CMC you see today with the campus we first stepped foot on in 2011. We have changed what it means to be a CMCer. We have started the tough conversations about sexual assault and social policies. We have taken the athletic teams to new and unbelievable levels of success. We have started organizations and clubs and movements and businesses. We have tried to find meaning and comfort after the loss of one of our own. We have been each other's family when we needed it the most and when it wasn't easy. We have kept the parts of ourselves that drew us here, but we have grown into adults and leaders. We have changed this place. And CMC class of 2015, that's why I'm so proud to graduate with you today. CMC, as an institution, has been integral to all of our successes and growth. Where would we be without the professors who challenged us to work harder than we ever thought we could and who were still there for us even when we failed? Where would we be without the administrators and staff who supported us, 
stood up for us and called for backup when we were a little too wild. Where would we be without the picturesque architecture of North Quad or the opportunity to watch the sunset from the top floor of Kravis? All these things are important and unforgettable and beautiful, yes, but you, class of 2015, you are the CMC I'm proud to call home. CMC is us, and even when we leave here, it always will be. Congratulations to the class of 2015, and thank you. Clancy, we're grateful for your mistake. And CMC is you. CMC is you. Well, now it is my incredible pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Azar Nafisi, and to confer, uh, to confer upon her an honorary degree from the college. I point your attention to page 49 in your program for the formal citation of recognition. We've been reminded this year, tragically, in many areas of the world and the country, even on our Claremont campuses, that the free exchange of ideas, indeed, the freedom of our own identities, cannot be taken for granted. We must sustain these principles and urge others to do the same in the most vigorous way. Whether we are confronting acts of violence or intimidation, in Paris or Copenhagen, in our great national cities, or in our own communities, we have to join together in our strong commitment to free speech and freedom of identity. Our commencement speaker, our commencement speaker today, Dr. Azar Nafisi, has lived these commitments. Her 2003 memoir, Reading Lolita in Tehran, describes her clandestine efforts to teach works of Western literature to her female students in her own Tehran apartment. Her book, which remained on the New York Times bestseller list for well over two years, was a powerful, inspiring testimony to the human spirit, a book that describes her own struggles in Iran after the revolution and simultaneously speaks to all of us. Dr. Nafisi courageously sustained the life of the mind and the power of critical intellectual engagement, even in an atmosphere of intolerance. Her most recent book, The Republic of the Imagination, underscores the immense value she places on the, on the arts and humanities as they compete and interact with the growing priority on more technological and scientific endeavors. Dr. Nafisi directs anyone who thinks that arts and sciences are separate categories to, she was quoted as saying, take another look at the Einstein statue in front of the National Academy of Sciences, which reads, knowledge is limited, but imagination encircles the world. It is now my pleasure to confer our honorary degree to Do Dr. Nafisi, pursuant to the resolution adopted by the Board of Trustees. As I do that first, I'd like to thank Professor Robert Fagan, the Barton Evans and H. Andrea Nevis Professor of Literature and Chair of the Literature Department, as well as Director of the Gould Center, who was so instrumental in attracting Dr. Nafisi to honor us here today. And I wanna thank Trustee Alyssa Elbaz, Class of 1994, and Professor Wendy Lauer, the John K. Roth Professor of History, and George R. Roberts Fellow, and Director of the Magrublian Center for Human Rights, in assisting with the hooding and citation and diploma ceremony. Dr. Nafisi, will you approach? Dr. Nafisi, in recognition of your many contributions and achievements, as a leader in advocacy for literature, free expression, and human rights, 
Claremont McKenna College hereby confers upon you the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereto, in token of which we cause you to be vested with the hood of the college appropriate to your degree and present you with this citation and accompanying diploma. Congratulations and thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much, President Gadash. Thank you everyone um, for bestowing this honor on me. I have to admit to you that I never participated in any of my own graduations. So, um, and, and I remember that my father once came and told me that your mother wants to see a picture of you in the robe and the hat. So he took me to a, uh, you know, photographer, and we took a picture of me to send to my mother. So I officially now feel that I belong to the class of 2015. And thank you, thank you. Finally, finally I made it. Finally I made it. Thank you. Um, you know, every time I come to a place like this, and I wanted to say this last night to some of the faculty and the trustees that were here, but I thought that I should save it and say it here to you, that one of the greatest things about books, one of the greatest things about doing what is really your passion in love, what you really care for in love, is that you are always through those, through that passion, and for me, through my books, you're connected to people you should be connected to. Not people whom you know because of where you were born or you know the place where you work or you need funding from them and, and, and things like that. It is about people who share the same dreams with you. It is about people who share the same passions with you. And the parents, I think every single parent here today knows when I say that books are like your children. You know, before they're conceived with love but before they come into the world, you go through so much anxiety. Did I go to the right doctor? Am I taking all the vitamins? Am I walking enough? Why did I eat that croissant yesterday morning? You know, how, what will, how will this affect my children? Should I sing to her or him? You know, um, and, and, and all sorts of questions you have. And then you go through the labor pain. And once the child comes into the world, you, are, you think you will guide him, but he or she will take you to amazing places and have you meet with intimate strangers that you had never be, met before. Strangers who become intimate because with them you share a common space, you share a common dream. So for that, I am very thankful to all of you, every single one of you here. And, and every time uh, I go to a place to talk, I try to invoke uh, some sort of a, a guiding spirit, some sort of kith and kin, a fairy spirit, to be with me, to sort of inspire what I have to say. And with this college, my first connection uh, to Claremont, my first, first actual visit to Claremont happened in 2011 when I came here uh, to celebrate uh, one of the greatest poets of 20th century, Czeslav Milos. And, and, you know, so I'm sure that his spirit is hovering someone around here. And then there was the spirit of one of the students, former students of your, one of your sister colleges, David Foster Wallace whose um, commencement speech I was hoping to steal today and read to you. Um, and then uh, last night I was told um, that um, the great Irish poet Seamus Haney has also been here and has also given a commencement speech. Unfortunately for you, I didn't have time to steal his commencement speech. So you are sort of in, um, uh, stuck with me. But one of the, but while we are here to invoke writers, and since I'm a writer, I wanted to say that one of the most important things I learned over the two, past two days I have been here, and every time I think of a college like this, is something that Bal James Baldwin used to say about, uh, about writers. Baldwin used to say, we writers are here 
to disturb the peace. And I think that this is the main function of a liberal arts college. This is the main function of knowledge. It is here to disturb the peace in the sense that it is here to provoke you to not only have you question the world, but in fact pose yourselves as a question mark. To shed your prejudices, your assumptions, your presumptions about the world, to be like that little girl named Alice who ran after the white rabbit and had the courage and the stamina and the passion to jump down that hole without knowing what will, what will be waiting her down that hole. As another great American writer, Mark Twain used to say, education is unlearning what you have learned. So I hope that this is what you are going to take away from uh, Claremont College, unlearning, a constant process of unlearning because this is what life is all about. And the reason that life and art are so interdependent and so closely related is in fact because of that fact. Now, um, I'm saying all of these things um, about writing, about knowledge, about disturbing the peace, when um, the dominant uh, sort of um, attitude in this country, especially among uh, our policymakers, be they Republican and a Democrat, and I'm not here to give a political speech, as far as I'm concerned, a pox on both their houses. Um, <laughs> so, I. I didn't come from a country where I was, not, I was denied freedom of association and freedom of speech um, to fall into f um, uh, the constrictions of ideological partisanship. Uh, but anyway, that was just sort of a parent parenthesis. <laughs> um, but what I wanted to say then is that a lot of people nowadays, and a lot of people unfortunately um, in our education policy, they claim that humanities are irrelevant to our lives. There are even some who have the audacity from among the universities to tell, people, uh, to tell their students, don't go into humanities because you won't find a nice vocation. So I just wanted to begin by disillusioning and unlearning these ladies and gentlemen with such claims. Because the life of ideas and imagination is not just something that you need today and then you can dispense with tomorrow. It is not your next iPhone that you can, you know, that you're in a hurry um, to throw away so that you can buy iPhone, I don't know what number it is now, 500, uh, uh, iPhone whatever, 100. Imagination and ideas are related to life because of the fact that they are related to our survival as human beings. 2,000 years ago, there were men called Aeschylus and Euripides and, and Homer. We don't know anything about who those men were, but it is their words that are enduring. Human beings became human and then became humane through telling the stories because imagination and ideas are a way of knowing the world are a way of discovering the world, and we need to know the world in order to survive in the world. And so the whole point is that that is how the foundations of this republic of imagination is first curiosity, that almost sensual urge to want to know, and just think that some people want to take that urge away from us. What does it mean to live in a world of ignorance? 
And, and so the whole point about curiosity is, as Vladimir Nabokov used to tell his students, he used to say to them, curiosity is in subordination in its purest form. Because, you know, we feel very good. Curiosity should not, in subordination, in its purest form, should not make you feel complacent and comfortable. It is not going and protesting against either Bush or Obama and then coming in front of the telly and watching somebody saying the same things that you just were protesting in your language in the news and then feeling good about it. In subordination, in its purest form, means constantly looking at the world through the alternative eyes of imagination and of ideas and of thought and constantly being jolted out of your complacency. That is what curiosity is all about. And those who say that science, I'm so glad you mentioned it, those who you know, segregate science and, and its sort of wayward child technology from humanities, again, they have to start and learning too. Because both genuine science and humanities are based on this desire to know and on the flexibility and lack of selfishness and lack of egotism that makes you change if you think you're wrong because your passion is more important than your prejudice. So the whole idea, as Nabokov again, I don't know why Nabokov, maybe his spirit, he was very mischievous. As soon as you name other authors, he feels a little bit jealous. Why not me, you know? Uh, so he keeps coming to my mind. But he himself was a um, well-known um, uh, scientist and a poet and a writer. Um, and he used to tell his students again, you need to have the passion of the scientist and the precision of the poet. Because if you are an Einstein, or if you are a Goethe, or if you are a Moliere, or if you are Auden, or if you are Emily Dickinson, or if you are Hafez, or if you are Rumi, whether you are a scientist or a poet, you need to have both passion and precision. And that is why science, genuine science, goes hand in hand with genuine um, uh, works of, uh, of humanities. Um, you know, I, I, talking about, you know, we, we deal in our everyday life both things that are transient and passing and things that are enduring and stay with us. And in this manner, works of imagination and art defy and resist not only the tyranny of man, but also the tyranny of time. They remind us of our continuity as human beings. Because in order to survive, and not just survive, but to live, and to live a joyous, fruitful life, then you need to know that it was something about the past in order to understand the present and in order to be able to project or foresee the future. That is why literature and art are a resistance against the transience of life, against all these little moments that as we experience them are passing, are dying, are being forgotten. And they register those moments so that like Nabokov wanted to say about his biography, so that we will have conclusive evidence that we have lived. Because oblivion is what knowledge resists most. As the East European uh, writer Tezavan Todorov used to say, only total oblivion demands total despair. So we need history, we need fiction 
in order to be able to constantly renew ourselves and in order to be able to constantly redefine ourselves. When I, uh, well, I have to now admit, you know, people sometimes ask you in interviews, what is your secret sin? And the secret sin turns out to be something really mundane, like mine, I love mysteries, you know. I'm in love with um, Raymond Chandler, and I love a lot of television. I mean, I love Simpsons, I used to like some, uh, uh, John Stewart, yada, yada, you know. Okay, but I remember that once I was watching Boston Legal, and as I was watching Boston Legal, I thought, oh my God, this is such a reminder of Antigone. That Antigone lives in an episode of Boston Legal because Antigone is also about the choice between what you as an individual feel is your integrity. So she wants to bury her brother for this personal sense of integrity to honor her brother, but her uncle and the king and the state want to hang him in public, leave him in public and she has to make a decision. And the same thing is in Boston Legal where this young girl doesn't want the body of her father who was an alcoholic and it was given to this museum uh, so that people will see, you know, if you drink, what will happen to you. She wanted that body taken away because as she wanted to steal or as she stole it. Anyway, what I want to try to say to you is that imagination and thought are not the property of even this august place. They came out of the need of the majority of people. And Dickens, Austin, Shakespeare, Aeschylus, Rumi, people in my country, the country of birth, Iran, might not be able to read, but they know Hafez and Rumi and Saadi by heart because it comes out of the heart and because we need the heart in order to be able to communicate and in order to remain human. Now, I just wanted to do two things and, and um, end this. Um, it is always wonderful to talk about democracy until you have the microphone um, and, 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 and sort of um, um, move on with our celebration. And I wanted to just say that all of these things I said, I wanted to make it a little bit more concrete uh, about two experiences in the two countries I called my home. One is about Iran and the other one, uh, I want to end with the, the United States of um, uh, America. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, was very much shocking to me uh, when I came, I left the uh, US in 1979 which coincided with um, uh, the uh, onset of the Islamic Revolution. My timing is not very good. Um, I remember when I went back to Iran, I went back to um, fundamentalism, terror, and the war in Iraq. And when I returned to United States in 1997, I returned to fundamentalism, terror, and the war with Iraq. Uh, so I suggest you be careful and not go where I go. Um, but, uh, but anyway, when I came back in 1997, I realized there was a very different attitude uh, towards my country, Iran, but towards what, was now, what is now called the Muslim world. And since I had been away for 18 years, this was very new to me. And, and, and what I realized was, first of all, um, the fact was that um, people could not really talk about um, these countries. Um, every time I went somewhere and mentioned about how the um, system in Iran is oppressing us or oppressing me as a woman, they would look at me and they say, oh, but you're Western. Or they would say, it's their culture. And then they would say, we shouldn't be talking about, and this in academia, by the way, we shouldn't be talking about their culture uh, because, you know, that is the way they live. First of all, let us unlearn you of these illusions. It is their culture, and because it is their culture, you should be talking about it. Now, uh, when I first went to Hopkins, some of my colleagues would tell me, uh, you're really very lucky, you're a woman, and you come from an Islamic society, you'll get a great job. 
they go to women's studies or Islamic studies, and I would tell them, you go to women's studies and Islamic studies. I want to study the dead white males. <laughs> because of the fact, because of the fact that ideas have no boundaries, because of the fact that the republic of imagination is the only republic in this world where no matter from what nationality, gender, religion, um, or ethnicity you come, you knock on every door and that door opens to you. You can knock on Dante's door and talk to Dante. You can knock on Rumi's door and talk to Rumi. You can talk, uh, knock on Hafez's door and talk to Hafez. The whole idea of culture is that it should be constantly renewed and reseen and redefined through the alternative eyes of the others. That is how we unlearn and learn by talking about one another. It is one of the greatest insults to people who believe in Islam to say that you can't talk about them. They are different from us. It's their culture. Now, another thing that I realized about their culture was, okay, what is this culture you're talking about that we shouldn't be talking about? Now, the first thing was that in 1979, the countries um, that, uh, you know, there were countries ca called by their names, Iran, Turkey, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, Indonesia, countries with Muslim majority um, uh, population, but as in the case of Iran, the majority of them had very, very diverse uh, ethnicity and, and religious minorities and, and, and atheists and Marxists, in fact. You know, those countries, you know, when you name someone, by their name, you give them specificity, which is what fiction does. You don't generalize them out of existence. But now I came back to the United States, and all of a sudden, these countries had evaporated. They were all Muslim world. And by being Muslim world, we did not respect them. We did not respect the religion. What we did, we eliminated all those specificities, because we don't call Great Britain and Germany and France and United States the Christian world, we call them by their names. Thank you, thank you. So the whole idea, the whole idea was that Ralph Waldo Emerson was in love with the Persian poets. He has a poet about the Persian poet Saadi. He thinks that Hafiz was the light of the world. Goethe, the, the German, uh, the, the best known German poet, he was in love with Hafiz. He has a Divane Hafiz, a book on Hafiz. Matthew Arnold was in love with the epic poet Ferdowsi. And in return, and, and today, in this country, the British poet Dick Davis, who teaches at Ohio State, falling in love with Iran, is one of the best interpreters and translators of Iranian literature. And that is why you guys can be reading Iranian literature, because these others fell in love. And when you fall in love, you don't specify. I used to think that I would like to fall in love with a man six foot ten, um, blue green eyes, um, no mustache, uh, okay, so far so bad. Then I, <laughs> I fell in love with a man who was five foot eight, um, brown hair, and a bloody mustache. <laughs> you know? You don't know. You don't know. When you choose your vocation, you choose because you fall in love and you don't know why. And then the world changes, doesn't it? 
Your peace is disturbed. You can't sleep at night. Is he thinking of me? Does he like my eyes? What shall I wear tomorrow? You know, all of this, and, and also the sun on the leaves, on the flowers, on your friend's hair has a different color because you're in love. That is how life should be lived. And that is how a life of knowledge is lived. So to make this very long story short, then let us see what was the culture that they were saying is so good. And what was Iran's? I won't go into Egypt and Syria and Lebanon and Iraq, but all you have to do, even Wikipedia can give you examples of what these countries were all about. You know, that all of them are such ancient histories. Taliban doesn't have to bomb the, the Buddhas so that we in the West know that they had that culture. Iran doesn't have to kill a young girl called Nera Neda Agha Sultan so that the West would know that such a girl who was in love with uh, Wuthering Heights lived in a city named Tehran. But the culture that they assign to these amazing countries, which such amazing culture. My father used to tell me that Iran is an ancient country. It has been invaded many times, times and time over. But one of the only way we have kept our identities through our poetry. Our history is written through our epic poet Ferdowsi, going back from the mythology of 3,000 years ago, right until the, until the Arab invasion um, in, in seventh century. But what do they say about this culture? When the Islamic system came into being in Iran, the first thing that they did was to, um, uh, del I say delete, uh, I've forgotten the name for it, um, was to cancel the, the family protection law, which protected women at home and at work. They reduced the age of marriage for females from 18 to nine. Then after women protested and fought for many years, they elevated it to 13. They brought something that never existed in Iran, which was the punishment of stoning people to death for what they called prostitution and adultery, but polygamy and temporary marriages where a man could rent a woman from five minutes to 99 years was left free. And they called this Islam. I want to ask you, who insults Islam? Someone who says this is not religion or someone who says do not, do not insult my culture. And the issue of the veil was never in Iran about whether the veil is good or bad, although everyone has the right to say they don't like the veil or they do. The issue of the veil was about freedom of choice. It was about the fact that no power on earth, your father, your husband, your state, has the right to tell women how to dress and how to appear in public. And I'm so sorry. The whole, the whole idea about um, uh, these countries is that the first things they target, be it Soviet Russia, uh, be it uh, fascist Germany, uh, be it North Korea, is the right of women, culture, and minorities. That is their first targets. And this was the first targets in Iran. Now, I will very shortly, I mean, you can see all of this, uh, fortunately, through uh, social media, but before that, we had books, and I would have preferred that. Um, but the whole point, when women feminists tell me that I'm Western, this is how I respond to them. And I just give you this response and then we'll move on. I respond to them that a thousand years ago, in the 11th century, 
two books were published by two great Iranian poets. One was our epic poet Ferdowsi, and the other one was by a man named Fakhreddin Gorgani. They're both translated by Dick Davis. And the fact was that in these books, we had one, some of the strongest women, some of the most independent and liberated women you could find anywhere in the world. That these women not only chose their husbands, they chose their lovers for one night. That the book Visa and Ramin is about this young woman who before she's born, she's promised to the king. And she tells the king, I am too young for you. You are old. Go and find someone your own age to play with. It was the inspiration for Tristram and Isolde and all the other stories like the Romeo and Juliet that came out. And in this story, we say is far stronger than either Juliet or Isolde. We say the nurse is far better. God, I wish you'd know that nurse. She tells Vis, she says, you have never made love to a man to know how great it is. And you should, you know, fall in love, give in to this man who loves you, who's the king's younger brother, so that you will really understand the meaning of love. And it is one story, Romeo and Juliet type story that ends happily ever after, I'm glad to say. So the whole point that I'm trying to say is that then in 1936, the first woman who unveiled in Iran was not westernized. She didn't speak English or French. Her name was Tahere. She belonged to one of the most respectable religious families in her town. She married a man who was also very orthodox, and Tahere became the per, one of the leading lights of a new religion in Iran, which was called Babis, and later it is called Baha'is, and Baha'is today in Iran are treated the way Jews were in Nazi Germany. And one day among her followers, Tahereh takes off her, uh, her veil and says the universal advent has arrived. And, uh, I, uh, you know, uh, they say that two men among her followers were so shocked by seeing her face um, that rather than killing her, they cut their own throats. And I always use this metaphor. What is it in the appearance of a woman that makes these powerful men wanting to kill them? That they, if they want to survive, these women can survive. That is the power of what Vaclav Havel says, the power of the powerless. That was the power of the African Americans during the civil rights movement. The power of women, the power of everyone who is fighting for their freedoms. What is it in these helpless people with no weapons that wants these rulers to kill them? So, um, I just um, wanted to end by saying that um, when I talk about Iran, when you talk about another culture, um, the whole idea, uh, a lot of people come to me and say, well, what can we do for Iran? Well, one of the things you can do for Iran is just please read about Iran. Know the history. Know the erotic language. Know the dances. I wish you were at my son's wedding to see the dance and eat the wonderful food. Know that the Iranian poets in 14th century, like Hafez, were criticizing the orthodox clerics, saying hypocritical clerics who drink wine in private and flog people in public. In 14th century, we had an obscene poet named Obeid that in Dick Davis's Faces of Love, Norton could not publish the book for them because they said we cannot teach it in colleges like yours. <laughs> the obscene poet Iraj Mirza at the beginning of 20th century is one of our most beloved poets and he directly targets the hypocrisy of orthodox religion. Orthodox religion. Who does this remind you of? Mark Twain, for heaven's sake. Remember Huck. 
Remember Miss Watson. The whole idea is that in a country like Iran, as in a country like Soviet Union or North Korea, brutality is so obvious. The murders, the injustice, that we know it is brutal. What about this country? Are we all just free, land of the free, and going to stay free? That is the question that Iran poses to you. That you have not, in fact, been free. That freedom, like happiness, needs to be constantly pursued. That from the war of independence to the war of civil war, uh, to the civil rights movement and the women's movement and the minority movement to today, you constantly have been pursuing freedom. And people have died for it. Hundreds of thousands of people in this country have died for it. When women came out, when Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Harriet Beecher Stowe and Sojourner Truth came out, they told them women's place is at home. That is what Bible says. And Mark Twain in Huckleberry Finn gives you, and from then on, the greatest American novels, one after the other, give you what is the greatest threat to this great country. Conformity. Conformity. Complacency. Every single villain in that book is a conformist. You begin with Miss Watson, a nice church-going woman. Not one minute's hesitation to sell a man's children down the river. Violence doesn't just come from Hitler and Stalin. Violence exists in all of us if we allow it. It is both the heroism of the ordinary people and it is also the violence of ordinary people like Aunt Sally who makes good jam, who loves Huck, and who considers a black man's death as nobody dying. As uh, the Spanish poet Antonio Molina said, if a member of Gestapo can have a normal face, then any normal face can belong to the Gestapo. So what I want to end with, yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm everybody is getting, please start coughing, I'm leaving, I can. Uh, <laughs> What, so what I want to say at, at the end of this talk is that the whole idea of American novel, the greatest American novel, the imaginary map of America, they become like the moral guardians of the American. They reject like Huck wealth, they reject the hypocritical kind of religion and morality, and they make independence of mind their sort of center. So at this time of crisis, there is time of disruption, there's time of crisis, you go into the world, you don't know what kind of jobs you will have, but you're also part of a new world. You are also have the privilege of defining this crisis, disturbing the peace, not giving in to the complacency, and I hope that along with Alice, you will jump down the hole. And along with Huckleberry Finn, you choose to go to hell, but do the right thing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Matisse. Thank you for your fierce and brilliant example. Thank you so much. I ask that all candidates for the master's degree and the bachelor's degree please rise. All candidates.
Please rise. Mr. President, upon the recommendation of the faculty and with the approval of the Board of Trustees, I now have the honor to present the candidates here today together with others who, having completed all the requirements, are to receive the degree of Master of Arts in Finance and the degree of Bachelor of Arts as appropriate. By the authority vested in me as president of Claremont McKenna College, upon recommendation of the faculty and with approval of the Board of Trustees, I now confer upon you the degree of Master of Arts in Finance and the degree of Bachelor of Arts as appropriate. Graduates, please move your tassels from left to right with your right hand and be seated. You may be seated. Before we continue with Dean Warner and the conferring of degrees, I want to let you know that we will pause the moment when Ali Mirza would have been called to receive his degree. Following that pause, Dean Warner will call his name, and then we would like everyone to rise in support of his family and friends. Following that brief celebration of Ali and all he means to us, Dean Warner will continue with the next name called. Thank you. It is my honor to recognize the graduates receiving a master's degree. Ladies and gentlemen, please come forward as your names are read to receive your diplomas. Samuel Alexander Bagrov. <laughs> Dylan Scott Carter Campbell. Christopher Lee Darling. Partadinata Harianto. Kyle Stephen Howard. Ayush Jalani. Calvin Jiang. Kavya Jochi. Jeffrey Xiaoyu Liu. Charles Abdul Hamid Owens. Andrew Daniel Thero. Henry Hin. Naveen Ram. Vishnu Medipali Reddy. Sai Swaroop Revanuru. Sin Chie Sung. Chun Wan Si. Christopher, Aaron Christopher Vaccaro. Chi Wong. Victor Xiang. David Yang. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome your applause for the master's class of 2015. It is now my honor to recognize the graduates receiving degrees of Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts in Finance. Ladies and gentlemen, please come forward as your names are read to receive your diplomas. Brian Andrew Vivilaka. Michael Floyd Cornell. Philip Stark Crawford. Kartik Das. <laughs> Ar
Akicho Yoshida. Vahin Kosla. Jason Tam Kimura. Sarah Mostatabi. Andrew Nam. Kirthana Sai Duna. Dante Andreas Quazo. Cameron Andrew Whiting. Wee Xian Shi. Vicky Yang. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome your applause for the BAMA class of 2015. It is my honor now to recognize the graduates receiving the degree of Bachelor of Arts. Ladies and gentlemen, please come forward as your names are called to receive your diplomas. Mohammed Amin Abdul Rahim. Charles William Lucas Agnew. Richard Young J. On. Scott Edward Anderson. Antonia Evo Antonova. Henry Ernest Appel. Ratik Asokan. Elizabeth Ann Augustine. Christian Alessandro Ayala. Shesha Essi Bakenra Takande. Vedahi Bansal. Ashley Jusak Barnhill. <laughs> Nadia Stoshia Barulich. <laughs> Daniel Joseph Freifeld Beer. <laughs> Caleb Bentley. <laughs> Cameron Robert Bernhardt. Elon M. Bernstein. Nikhil Bombi. Mark August Bloomberg. Marie Bradvika. Dane Morrison Brown. Alexander John Hubert Brueger. Allison Francis Busaka. Sloan Caldwell. 
Laura Elizabeth Campbell. Daniel James Caesar. Sean Chai. Kelly Chan. Kunal Chande. Alexander Joshua Chang. Alice Huan Chang. Elizabeth Carolyn Chapin. Aaron Elizabeth Chavon. Jie Xing Chen. Asim Narenjan Chipilkati. Yunji Choi. Diana Maria Chuka. Grace Victoria Coburn. Megan Carey Coleman. Michael Philip Connell. Haley Elizabeth Connor. Anthony Matthew Contreras. Kimberly Marie Coombs. Madeline Grace Crawford. Matthew Allen Crawford. Braden Robert Crockett. Miriam Elizabeth Cruz. Kenneth Michael Kudanan. Caleb Dean Kunha. Brandon Hamilton Diort. Lindsay L. Davidson. Lilybell Kuule Deer. Evan Kefover Dion. Andrew Dobbs Kramer. Andrew Warren Dobbs. Joseph William Dorn. Jackson Stewart Doyle. Samuel Iwaguma Dunham. Louisa Celine Dunwitty. Catherine Marie Echevia. Elizabeth Davis Eggert. Michael Condon Elhart. Amelia Paris Evrigenis. Christopher Joseph Fang. Nadim Udin Faruqi. Elizabeth Jean Farr. Elena Maria Faust. Reed Garrett Furubayashi. Christopher Thomas Garter. Sarah Elizabeth Gabriel. Sophia Rose Gallant. Janelle Kimberly Garcelon. 
Amon goes. Dana Marie Gibson. Rita Gillis. Elizabeth Christine Janelli. Benjamin Thomas Goldberg. Sarah Marie Corral Gonzalez. Michael Anthony Goes. Harris Cristanto Gozali. Jack Richard Grodal. Chandrika Gupta. Stephanie Leah Haft. Janice Emmeline Hahn. Elise Hansel. Petra Chiputra Harun. Lauren Nicole Henderson. Sophia Claire Harriet. Marcel Stephen Height. John Joseph Benjamin Ho. Valerie Ting Yi Ho. Jeffrey Adam Hawkhauser. Kristen Barbara Howard. Christian Connor Hoxie. Allison C. Hu. Alvin Jeffrey Wong. Tess Alon Hubbling. Ji Young Ha. Jenna Hussein. Karina Teresa Huang. Midori R. Ishizuka. Rhea Jen. Hashim Musa Jamil. Hyo Sung Ju. James Cabellus II. Kelsey Elizabeth Mercado, Kading. Show Kenneth Kajima. Emily Ellen Kahn. Sumer Kandari. Yutsinia Amanda Kazmer. Julia Ann Keenan. James Edward Kelly. Lauren K. Kenny. Brian David Key. Ju Hyun Kim. MJ Minjun Kim. Madison Marie Knob.
Danielle Marie Knott. Derek Mooming Ko. Yen Fong Ko. Rose Ellen Coper. Allison Nicole Krugman. Sung Mo Ku. Sarah Amy Shiraishi Kukino. Samantha Nicole Coons. Samantha Rose Lapierre. Jasmine Wiley Erica Lai. Jessica Olivia Laird. Adrian Sai Hay Lam. Hester Hoi Ting Lam. Isabel Collier Lane. Ben, ben. Benjamin Isaac Lawson. David March Leathers. Edward Kevin James Leathers. Susie Lee. Martin Kanematsu Lafour. Isabel Tsuneko Lester. Andrew Palmer Levine Coon. Nathan Yanan Levine. Liang Li. Shinju Nancy Li. Zhu Yuan Li. Su Yuan Lin. Palin Liu. <laughs> Boris Chun Yin Lo. <laughs> Molly Renee Loftus. <laughs> Shelby Catherine Long. <laughs> Elena Ann Lopez. Emma Britt Ludlam. <laughs> Yi Luo. Andrew Hamilton McPhail. Julian Ecker Mackey. Samuel Arnulfo Malagon. Karan Malik, Karan Malik. Kasvi Malik. Nicholas Evan Marino. Mackenzie Nicole Mars. Brianna Victoria Maciel. Ashraf Halim Mathur. Alexander Anthony Mauro.
Kira Megan McAndrews. Charles Andrew McGregor. Sean Lawrence McCaveney. Nikita Mahandrew. Alexander Jordan Mendoza. Samuel Philip Myers. Abigail Rose Michelson. Cora Rebecca Miller. Ali Mayumi Minamida. Ali Wallace Mirza. Thank you. Joshua John Mittler. Christian Udodi Mapado. Charles Richard Montgomery. Regina Olga Mullen. Niti Nagar. Noreen Ali Nanji. Joshua Warren Naon. Sachith Naredi. Nicholas Brandon Nassi. Joseph Kelly Newman. Christian Charles Neumeister. Monique Wynn. Mark August Nitzel. Devin Michael Nishizaki. <laughs> Kayla Ann Non. <laughs> Philip Wells North. <laughs> Alex David Nuffer. Ian Eugene O'Grady. <laughs> William Albert Ostermeyer. <laughs> Gabriella Denise Ozer. <laughs> Shuvik Hall. <laughs> Sheila Yvette Panez. Melanie Carolyn Patey. Henry James Jackson Pelicoro. Margo Sarah Penn. Samuel Victor Perella. Felipe A. Z. Peterson.
Samuel Francis Pitkavage, Sridhar Podar, Jeremy Ishmael Porter, Chase Michael Pribble. Costa Alexander Saltis. Corinne Jessica Ragland. Christopher Joseph Rama. Sanjana Vijay Rao. Zane Pavlich Ravenholt. Chad Ian Redman, Sean Harold Raymer, Bradford Kresge Richardson, Cameron Christo Ridley. Aaron Kathleen Vopolak Ristig. John Michael Rizzo. Daniel McDonald Roberts. Grace Elizabeth Rodriguez. Rebecca Lynn Rosenthal. Alexandra Joy Ruark. McClatchy Jack Ruskin. Erica Sun Yun Sa. Michelle Lynn Sape. Maya Hammonds Sandalo. Martin Richard Sartorius. Kimberly Oywa Scammon. Theodore Connor Schlegel. Haley Jane Schultz. Talia Samantha Siegel. Elena Ruth Segarra. Sarah Lucia Servine. Anshu Shah. Sachin Prakash Shah. Viraj Shastri. Sally Shearer. Jacob Alexander Shimkus. Patrick John Schultz. Ali Siddiqui. Jennifer Lee Sitton. Evan Alexander Saul. Logan Pardo Solomon. Alexandra Redeen Sonnet. Tyler Allen Sonnemaker. Haley Lillian Sparks. Colin Joseph Spence. 
Stephen Clay Spencer. Charles Lorang Spinoza. Malika Srinivasan. Jonathan Stephen Starr. Madeline Lee Stein. Sydney Ann Stevenson. James Russell Stevick. Timothy Theodore Storer. Marissa Emiko Suahiro. Arvind Suresh. Christina Marie Sutherland. Philip Takaki Suzukawa Tseng. Sarah Elizabeth Swartz. Kyle Ryan Tangway. Olivia Tay. Abinaya A. Thenapan. Isaac Lawrence Thomas. Jared Scott Reichert Thomas. Joshua Aaron Thomas. Benjamin Falk Tillotson. Dante Renato Topo. Jennifer Marie Torres. Katie Tretanero. Lancy Boyd Tripp. David Tung Ming Si. Jensen Richard Toomey. Benjamin Fine Waldman. Corey Wong. Francis Wang. Trisha Wang. Kyle David Weiss. Nicholas Joseph Weiss. Garrett Deland Wells. Jocelyn Nicole Wenzel. Christopher Allen Wheat. Max Dylan Winsberg. Warren Cody Wood. David Charles Weich. Don Mai Xiang. Bonnie Yi Min Yan. Grant Yang. Tian Xiao Ye. Nikki So Yun Ye. Alina Elizabeth Young. Elham Yusuf Ali. Jacqueline Ann Zayner. Ladies and gentlemen,
the class of 2015. Graduates, thank you everybody, congratulations. It's time before the charge for a few closing words from your classmate, senior class president, Abby Michelson. As Abby prepares for her postgraduate career in marketing and PR, we all know she'll be successful. Here's one reason, earlier this semester, she coordinated an overnight trip for over 100 members of the senior class to Las Vegas. And remarkably, everyone who left got back safely. Here's another reason. Uh, she's done it all at CMC. Senior class president, campus tour guide, senior interviewer, dorm activities chair, and the project coordinator for the Center for Civic Engagement. She studied abroad in both Tel Aviv and Copenhagen. Most impressive is her advocacy for the health and well-being of society, including, in particular, the treatment of heart disease. She turned to deep personal loss of her dad, a member of CMC's class of 1983, into a transformative service leadership opportunity for others. That loss has been a powerful inspiration, propelling her to lobby on Capitol Hill and in the halls of the FDA. Since high school, she's volunteered for the American Heart Association, and campaign for tobacco-free kids, winning National Youth Advocate of the Year from both organizations. Thus, it's an honor and an inspiration to introduce your senior class president, Abby Michelson. Good afternoon. As one of my final acts as class president, I sent out an email a few weeks ago that read, class of 15, 2015, a few reminders. Number one, nobody's perfect, including your class president. I had made a mistake by accidentally leaving out the cutest couple that never was category from the senior superlative ballot, and was asking that seniors fill out a separate ballot just for this category. Ironically, the guy who would end up being in the winning cutest couple that never was, Ben Tillotson, posted a screenshot of the email on Facebook with the caption, best class email yet. Thanks, Ben. Several comments were then posted, including a link to the Hannah Montana, Miley Cyrus, Nobody's Perfect music video. The song hadn't crossed my mind while writing the email, but once I watched the video, I realized that while the lyrics are not a work of musical genius, they were actually quite relevant to our impending graduation. When Miley sings, and I apologize for my less than stellar singing skills. Sometimes I'm in a jam, I've gotta make a plan. It might be crazy, I do it anyway. <laughs> we're, remi <laughs> we're reminded that all of us are in some sort of jam, stressing out about our life after graduation. Where will we be traveling this summer? Where will we be working? How much money will we be making? How will we ever survive without the meal plan and chocolate-covered strawberries every afternoon at tea? Yet, as Miley asserts later in the song, nobody's perfect, you live it and you learn it, and if you mess it up sometimes, nobody's perfect. <laughs> and we realize <laughs> that we're going to make mistakes over the next few years. We're going to stumble, we're going to have rough days at work, struggle to make rent, find our way around a new city, but we need to all remember that it's okay to make these mistakes, to struggle and to fail, because these are the experiences that will make us who we are and allow us to grow. 
And if anyone has the audacity, determination, and attitude to overcome these obstacles, it's a cmc -er from the class of 2015. From the first day of our woe trips to thesis fountain party, we've all transformed into intelligent, inquisitive, and in, uh, innovative young men and women. We've learned how to think critically, how to lead by example, how to network like it's nobody's business, and even how to properly pass a bread basket around a table. Thank you, John Feranda. And beyond all of this, each and every one of us has contributed in some way or another to CMC's community, whether it be through ASCMC, SOURCE, the SIF, the ROSE, the CCE, or one of the many other acronyms on campus. And most significantly, we've built a class of 2015 family. I've seen old friendships strengthen and new friendships form at senior events this year. I've seen us reach out to other classmates in times of need. I've seen us cheer each other on at athletic games and other competitions. And this past week in San Diego, I saw our class bond together and celebrate our accomplishments over the past four years. The fun we had during senior week makes me very excited for the future. Alumni weekends, our re many reunions, and CMC events. When we reunite in the future, I know it's gonna be a blast. The bond we formed over the past four years is incredibly strong. However, it is up to us to maintain it. We must stay in contact with one another, reach out to each other in times of need and joy. Send Snapchats to every classmate in your contacts when something super awesome happens. And post funny stories and videos in our Class of 2015 Facebook group for when we're bored at work. While we're all heading off to different cities, countries, and continents, it is my sincerest hope that our bond stays strong, that our friendships thrive, and that our love for each other and for CMC never dwindles. Class of 2015, it is such an honor to serve as your class president for life and to speak to you today. Uh, well, I look forward to the future and the fun times we will share together as alumni. While Miley Cyrus's lyrics teach us that nobody's perfect, I'd say the class of 2015 is pretty close to it. Congratulations, good luck, and see you on Green Beach at Alumni Weekend 2016. Thank you, Abby. Chairman Magrublian, Dr. Nafisi, Dean Warner, faculty, trustees, alumni, families, friends, and especially the class of 2015, it is a privilege to stand before all of you today to conclude our commencement with CMC's traditional charge to our graduates. When you graduate from college, you get lots of advice. Most of it sound, only some of it actionable. Career advice about market or policy trends or inspirational salvos, about dreaming or thinking big, giving back, taking risks, changing the world. I know this class. You know markets and politics, you understand risk, you think big, many of you are already changing the world. So let's talk today about the small acts, the little questions, the micro deeds, the pedestrian steps, and how to inspire them with purpose. So much of life, it turns out, is in the details. Prose moves through punctuation, Everest scales one step at a time, Strategy relies on momentary execution. Great religions call for daily ritual. Humanity moves through social graces. Indeed, the banality of good is the most powerful antidote to the banality of evil. I don't mean details without purpose. Those clutter, drag, and numb. I mean details fused with vision, values, goals, Purpose weaves small acts into a rich, intentional, resilient social fabric. The big challenges, the big ones of environment, water, air, energy, health and poverty, illiteracy and numeracy, violence and prejudice, the partitions that separate us, race, religion, gender identity, culture, can only be overcome in the end through the emergent properties of small acts. The simple questions to a friend in need. Are you okay? Can I help you? Did I hurt you? Did I misunderstand? Or the humor Clancy uses to help us understand ourselves. Or the different peer-to-peer -peer conversations she helped to lead. Or the practical steps to greater health that Abby has worked so hard to embed. 
or Dr. Nafisi's courageous act of reading the book of with several young women in her apartment in Tehran. Small acts change the world. Small courageous acts that align principle, value, and purpose with the needs of others. That will help you lead a life of greater meaning and success in all you seek to achieve. So I now ask our graduates to stand so that you may receive your charge. Let's first think about how you got here. Your parents or, helped, or others who helped you grow up and what they did for you. Every load of laundry, every mac and cheese, every drive to school, field, test, pool, store, or court, every comforting shoulder when you were down, every high five or hug when you were up. Let's think about your teachers, your coaches, your mentors, every red mark to correct your mistakes, every direction from the sideline, every encouragement, you can do it, we believe in you. The people on our staff who cleaned your rooms, prepared your meals, and answered your questions. Yes, these were all small deeds with a purpose to grow in you the special virtues you can contribute in turn for others. So what does this mean for you today and on Monday? This means calling frequently, calling, even texting your parents to see how they are doing. This means telling your old professors at CMC what they meant to you, what you learned from them. Or this might mean just picking up a piece of trash on the street, giving directions to someone who's lost, apologizing in person to someone you've hurt, always volunteering, putting your hand up in the air to take responsibility for a tough task at work, or to point out some wrong done to others putting your attention on those around you and what you can do for them, asking yourself what you don't know about others and committing yourself to finding out. So as you're thinking about your next IPO or how you're gonna bring down ISIS, make lots of room for the small stuff. When you're with others in any setting, turn to the most immediate questions. How are you? What do you need? How can I help you? How can I contribute? Offer an ear to a friend, give up your seat in the front of the bus, stand up to pose a critical question, engage, yes, as Dr. Nafisi urged, your curiosity, read and discuss a book that goes against the political, cultural, or conventional grain. No matter how small the, need, the deed or task, if you do this and do it in service of others, you will learn you will lift those around you, you will lead. Now here's the easy part. You already know how to do this. Beneath the surface of your objective accomplishments, within the deeper soul of your best personal experiences, you know what to do. I observe it every day in the way you build friends, ask questions at the AF, pull outsiders into our community, grow new institutions, solve tough problems, get beneath the surface, want to make a difference. Think of Clan Clancy and Abby and what makes them so special, the way they've used their wit, their service to make your lives better. And think of how you each have practiced that in each of you, in your own way, for one another, for all of us. Yes, we're not perfect, but this ability is evident. Improve it, build on it, deepen it, share it, that is your way, that is our way. Take that CMC across the stage with you, across the stage today, across the many thresholds in your life. Contributing questions, ideas, small deeds for others, that is our comerchio. Helping others to build community and lead by example, that is our kibitas. That is our signature. That's the story of Claremont McKenna College. Clancy put it best, CMC is you. Thank you for the honor to celebrate that today and many congratulations to you all.